I'm the Director of Grant Making and Programs at Humanities DC, which is the Humanities Council for Washington DC. We are so excited to be here live and in person with you all at the 14th Street Graffiti Museum. At Humanities DC, we believe in the power of music, art, history, culture to transform our lives, and we fund individuals, organizations, and nonprofits to do just that, and that's part of what we're here for tonight. We developed Humanitinis to provide DC residents with the opportunity to share their original humanities research and work to the public. And as Humanitini curator, they create a public humanities program based on that research. Please stay in touch with Humanities DC so you can take part in more of our programs and consider applying for future grant opportunities. There should be flyers around that list our next few upcoming events, and you can also go to our website as well. Thank you to Jimmy Watkins, our program coordinator, who works closely with all our project directors, and Eli, our grants manager, and Mike, our communications coordinator, are also in the audience. And with that, I'll turn it over to Corey so we can introduce the panelists and the program. Uh, shout out to the AI crew who rocked an excellent new production in the upper gallery. Um, it's great to see those guys back on the wall after about 20 years. And it's really just a, uh, a real strong statement to what this space is about. It's about uh, preserving and appreciating the artists who created this street art movement that we're seeing here, uh, sweeping not only through the city, but through the country and through the world, and honoring those artists who were here and creating all those years ago. Um, and with that, in mind, I want to introduce to you our panelists for tonight. Uh, first, uh, sitting here to my left, uh, a woman who I've had the pleasure of working with for a number of years. Um, I grew up hearing her name echoed in the halls of the high school I went to and every club that I went to. Uh, everyone was telling me that, oh, you write graffiti? You need to meet Michelle Love. And, um, so with that, I'd like to introduce you to my friend, uh, a mentor, someone I consider a mentor, Miss Sita Sadali, AKA Miss Shell Love. Go, 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 go. <laughs> you get a lot of love out there. Heady, it's all heady. <laughs> so uh, our second panelist is literally a legend. Um, there's really no way Table form to introduce this person other than say, uh, this person is a legend uh, in the graffiti community for being one of the first writers in the city. Um, she's legendary for getting her name shouted out on so many go-go tapes. Uh, I heard her name actually before I saw her name. I didn't know she wrote graffiti. I just thought this person you know, was someone important because of how many times I heard their name repeat it over. Um, I'd like to introduce you to Lisa Henry, AKA Lisa of the world. Please come on. Uh, we talked about this panel for a few months and I thought it was gonna be a special situation and just sitting here right now, I can tell you that definitely is. Like uh, being here, uh, sitting here with these two ladies. I know that we're gonna get to the core of what the Bricklayers live streams are about, which is about talking to foundational artists who have made a significant impact in the city. Um, before we do get into the actual conversation, though, I do wanna take uh, just another second to remember our friend Dan Hogg, uh, Cool Disco Dan, who is the uh, inspiration behind this space, um, the amazing portrait painted by our friend Eric B. Ricks, uh, really is a testament to the love that this city feels for Dan, our community in particular, but uh, every year that we have gone without him, and I meet new people who share new stories about how Dan influenced them or how Dan was a part of their lives, I know that uh, a space like this is super important uh, because Dan as a person was super important to all of us. And it's just really great to see everyone come out for him um, and light candles for him um, and just be in this space that's dedicated to him. Um, and so again, happy Cool Disco Dan Day to everyone. 
Uh, but I'm going to set it up with just, you know, kind of prefacing that if you have a concept of what graffiti art is and what graffiti writing is, you know that it comes uh, from a place, you know, it comes from New York City initially and then kind of spreads around the world. But um, what a lot of people don't know is that there was a name writing culture that pre-existed New York City subway graffiti. And here in Washington, D.C., we call that go-go graffiti because it was tied so intrinsically to the go-go scene. Um, and so uh, the, the first question I want to throw out is going to be to you, Lisa. And uh, because you started writing in 1982, uh, that was pretty early for Washington, D.C. But I'm wondering, when you were growing up, did you see other names written on the wall before you started? Mm, not really. I wasn't really paying attention back then. Mm -hmm. You know, my thing, my main focus was for me to put my name up there. Mm -hmm. I wasn't. <laughs> what, yeah. what was the impetus for that? What, what, what made you want to start writing your name out? Because when I started going to the go-go, the main focus is for you to get your name called out when you go to the show. Okay. And I want everybody to see my name. So you thought if you wrote it on the wall, then it would be a lot easier for people to start recognizing it. Yeah, they know who I am once we're in the go-go. Were there other names being written at that time? R.E. Randy, Gangster George, Kanye F., Jumper Janet. They were already going. Yeah, they was with me, but then they stopped early. Okay, okay. Um, I Because I asked the same question for Randy. Like, you know, because you guys for Washington DC are predate, you know, us getting things like Style Wars and uh, Wild Style the movie, you know, that really brought graffiti, particularly into the suburbs, but brought it into the city. But you guys were really, you know, doing it a, a year or so before that happened for DC. And so I always wondered, you know, what the impetus is for people to start writing their names. Uh, I did an interview with uh, with a woman not too long ago, and she talked about in 1976, she was going to Roosevelt High School, and she used to ride the bus every day to school. And on that bus, in, inside of Roosevelt, she used to see go-go food stamps. And so that would be like the earliest date, you know, that someone had said to me, oh, I saw graffiti that early. Um, and so it's always interesting, like I said, to you know, kind of get that. So I'm going to bring that question over to to you, Sita. Um, and I know we've talked about this before, but I'd like for you to share with the folks what was the the thing that inspired you to start writing your name mm. and just to start to paint out like that. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, so I grew up in Hyattsville down uh, Rhode Island Avenue and we would travel into the city to go to the Indonesian Embassy. My mother's from Indonesia, Java specific specifically, and um, we would just travel up and down, up and down Rhode Island Avenue. And I, as a little kid, I would see, start to see little things, um, probably, in, I don't know, just before preteen, I saw um, Sir Rectis, um just before Rhode Island Avenue. Yeah, um, and it, that, that captivated me. But really what it was, was um, in high school, at Northwestern High School, I found a anti-drug pamphlet in the counselor's office. And it was, you know, horizontal layout. It was all burners, just say no, you know, these, all these phrases, but painted by Zephyr from New York. Mm. And I was just captivated, like, what is this? What are these letters? I started to just replicate all, it was pretty thick, so it had a, the whole alphabet. So I would start to um, airbrush, you know, like the matching jean jackets and the jeans and people's names. And um, really before I met anyone, mm -hmm. um, and I wasn't really even into hip hop yet or anything like that. I was hanging out with kind of a, an esoteric underground scene of um, people that were into like late 70s London culture, like Caribbean London um, culture. Anyway, so I would go to Georgetown and I would start tagging like my name and you know bands that I liked. But that was before I had really met anybody uh -huh. and knew anything more about the culture other than this pamphlet. Were you writing Shell back then? 
I was writing C E T A. Mm. Yeah, so no tag yet. You know, I nice. didn't. That came later when I met people, and they encouraged me to come up with something. Right. So it was more just like writing things and drawing things on the wall, mm -hmm. not my name. Yeah. I guess sort of the opposite of Lisa. Well, I mean, you were writing Sita, you know, oh, that came after. Yeah, oh, yeah, after. Okay. Yeah. Um, Lisa, like when you when you chose your name, I mean, you know, later generations of graffiti writers will just will choose to disguise their identities, right? Like and say, I'm going to create a name that has nothing to do with like what my friends and family call me. But you chose something different. You took your name and you just started, you know, kind of writing it out. Um, can you tell us about like how you you came up with the the name Lisa of the World? Well. Um... And I, I seen some say of the world. And I said, well, I'm going to name myself Lisa of the world. Mm -hmm. So I could be around the world, known, famous, whatever. That was my objective. Like I said, I was with go, 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 be. And I said, everybody recognized that name. I, I didn't want to be nobody else's name or anything. Can't nobody represent my name. It's only for me, one Lisa of the world. Yeah. So that was my purpose. Uh, back then, there were people who were adding of and then, you know, some other adjective, right, that, that, that was attached to their name. Um, and that that was a very, like, uh, beyond DC view, you know what I'm saying, for yourself. A lot of, there were folks that were very primarily center focused in the neighborhood, right? Um, and so you saying of your of the world was kind of you taking you even beyond the city. Is that, is, would that be fair? Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you remember the first time you wrote your name, like on a bus? Uh, no. <laughs> no, no. I mean, it's been a, it's been a while, so it's fair, you know. Um, there's a there's a, a story about the spray cans that I want to talk about. We'll say that for a little bit later. But um, you told me one time you were standing outside of a club, waiting to get in and you wrote your name on the wall and it caught you. Can you talk a little bit about that? And then how old were you when that was happening? I think I was around maybe 15, 16, and I was at Cherry's Club up in on Palana Street. And I was waiting to go in the go-go and me and my friend, her name was Sexy Shelly. And we decided to write our name outside and they caught us and they made us wash the walls and everybody was going in the club. <laughs> so you and Shelly were out there scrubbing the walls down? Yeah. That, that, you know, one, when you told me that, I, I, I just had this image in my head, you know what I'm saying? Of course, you being 15 and like, you know, having to do that, going into a go-go is kind of just kind of like hilarious. But that the fact that you were with another female writer, and I know that, you know, go-go Tanya F, and there are a number of other female writers from, from that time, um, do you remember, uh, you know, just from a, from your perspective, like, you know, was the writing culture back then, like, more diverse in terms of, you know, because uh, nowadays it's mostly a lot of dudes that write graffiti. Were there a lot of women that were writing graffiti back then? Not at all. Like I said, it was just me, her name Sexy Shelly, Money Making Mini, Tanya and Janet that I've seen. Mm. Over the years. Okay. Mm. So that would still be pretty small compared to the number of guys that were writing at the time. Yes. So when you started, you were how old? Uh, like 12, 13. Wow. That's, I mean, you realize that's a whole movement that happened, you know, in that age where she was coming out and Ari Randy was coming out. You know, there were hundreds of kids that were participating in this name writing culture. Mm -hmm that was centered around GoGo. And it's something that's so unique to Washington, D.C. and the Washington, D.C. experience. Um, Sita, when you started writing, were there other women that were really getting up and, and participating in the culture that way? I can't remember anyone. Yeah. Can you from that time period? I mean, aside from Lady Pink, you were you were the first other female graffiti writer that I had heard of when I started writing. Right. But I mean, we we grew up in the same neighborhood. We went to the same high school. So, like I said, in the in the halls, echoed Michelle Love. 
you know, there were, I saw drawings and stuff and signatures uh, and places. And so, but you were the only other one, you know, until blue. Right. Yeah, I was going to say. And uh, for those of you who were around in the mid and late 1990s, Blue uh, was a notorious graffiti bomber in the city um, who put in some very significant work. Um, but at that point, I hadn't heard of any other female graffiti writers. And I know that, that there were others, you know, but just at that point, I hadn't. Um, and in your experience, you didn't come across any other ladies who were writing graffiti at that Not time. Not around here, no, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah, which is, I think, one of you know one of the many reasons why it's important to have conversations with you, Lisa, and with you, Tita, because you represent a a portion of the culture that you know um, for many years has been kind of like overshadowed. I mean, even though you stand out because you're uh, amongst you know groups of, of of young men or men in this case, you know nowadays um, that your your contributions are you know are to be highlighted because you're doing something that's outside of the norm and you know maybe later we could talk about how you know the there's been a shift in the culture over the last few years and how we are seeing more female representation and folks coming out and painting on the walls and being a part of the culture um, but i think it's important to to note that eight in lisa's time and in tita's time which you know are about 10 years off you know um that there were not that many women doing this. Mm -hmm. um, and that the fact that you were out there and you were painting with the crews that you were painting with at the time um, are very, very significant. Mm -hmm. um, you know, speaking of crews, uh, Lisa, you are a member of GAC, um, or, or I don't know if the appropriate term is to say that you are, or you were, you were, you were a member of GAC. Uh, would you explain to everyone who, who may never have heard those initials uh, what GAC is and what it meant in the city uh, when you were running around? It was a bunch of guys and girls in different neighborhoods. We called ourselves the Gang of the Chronicles, which we just go around and go go uh, fights and stuff like that. That's when we weren't killing back then, mm. and it was fun. So basically... That's what it was. He was always going against the 18 Big Macs. Mm -hmm. So that's what it was. Um, and Gangster Chronicles has a storied history in the city, you know, legendary in terms of DC street crews. Uh, and you were there, like, when the, the crew was named, correct? When it first started, started from Alley Cat. Can you, can you tell us about that day? Um, I think we were sitting in the back of Roosevelt, uptown, and he was just talking about creating a gang, a neighborhood gang, and he came up with the name Gangsta Chronicles. I was like, yeah, that sounds about right then. The Lady Chronicles, the Lady Chronicles came along with it. Mm. So we was real big. And that was an, an immediate, like there's Gangsta Chronicles, there's Lady Chronicles? Yeah. And were you running Lady Chronicles? Yeah. So <laughs> if anybody was getting down, they had to come talk to you first? <laughs> Basically. Okay. okay. <laughs> Um, it, it's kind of, I know if we think about like how we want, you know, our community to be, we're like, oh yeah, we don't really want gangs, but we're really talking about teenagers, you know, and a, and a group of teenagers that are coming together, uh, centered around writing graffiti, centered around listening to music and centered around occasionally fighting with each other, uh, which was the, the norm, you know what I'm saying, for most kids back then. Um, so, you know, when we, when you know, if uh, we use the term gang, I don't want to use it in a derogatory, you know what I'm saying? Because I feel like uh, sometimes gangs offer a support system and a family system that people don't often get. Um, and graffiti crews are much in the same way. Uh, we don't call ourselves gangs, we call ourselves crews, uh, but it, they work in the same way. Um, Sita, when, when you were making, uh, I guess, a transition into doing more traditional forms of, of like, I. I don't know if you call it like New York graffiti, um, the stuff that Zephyr did on the pamphlet. Uh, you know, did you have any outlets? Were there any places for you to go? Were there people that you met that were, you know, kind of instrumental in, you know, you know, you being on that path? Yeah, my, my sister, one of my sisters, Addie, worked at Tower Records in Rockville um, and in the video department. And Da was actually working in the video department. Mm. So that's how I met him. 
um, hanging out with him. He, he came from the Bronx, so he came with a very distinct style and a very, you know, distinct attitude. Um, and I was just hanging out with him and seeing um, a couple of other folks um, from Queens, same, and seeing, um, and just really, that's when I really began to learn so much about the culture from his tutelage. Um, I really consider him the grandmaster, my grandmaster, just in terms mm. of style. Mm -hmm. um, that's when it really took off, you know, visiting, um, uh, you know, uh, New York and, and uh, just, just really steeping myself into um, areas where there were lots of burners. Um, I never really saw trains um, until a lot later on. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and for those of you, uh, the, the artist she named is Da. His piece here in the museum is right here in the back corner. It says DE1. Uh, but he came down to also celebrate Dan's life when we commemorated the space in 2020. Um, and, and you became a member of H-Bomb's group. Yeah, technically, yeah. Technically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not yeah. officially, yeah. technically. H-Bomb uh, is a, a, one of our you know, top crews from Washington, D.C., from the, the mid-90s um, that you know, were kind of instrumental in cementing the graffiti style here in Washington, D.C. And I say technically because it, the name of the crew was Hispanic Bombers, and I'm not Latina, so. I'm, I I'm also mean. not, but I am a member of H-Bomb. Oh. So apparently the rules have been eased, <laughs> and, right. and I'm happy for it. <laughs> Um, Lisa, you've had a, a friendship with Ari Ramy for a number of years. And, you know, uh, the last time we did one of these uh, bricklayer panel discussions, which we had Da and we had Mesk and Ari Randy come and talk with us, he told me that the whole reason why he stopped using markers was because of you. Do you know anything about that? No, I do not. Well, Specifically, he said that one night you went on the 8th Street Bridge and you wrote your name in the middle of the bridge with black spray paint, really, really big. And that that moment, he said to himself that he needed to start doing something a little bit different than what he was doing <laughs> with the markers. You, can you tell us about that? You remember that night at all? I do remember. The thing, my focus was, because I've seen some spoke game names somewhere. Mm. Yeah. So you were already seeing Dan get up and get up with spray paint? Yeah. And then, so Dan was kind of like your inspiration to do that. Yeah, even though I saw him before him. Right. But the places that he was at, I said, okay, yeah, I can't get up there. I said, you keep it high, I keep it low. Right, <laughs> right. And so... You know, for, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the timeline, you know, uh, Lisa is starting in 1982. She's already getting up. Ari Randy is starting in 1983. He's already getting up. 1984, Cool Disco Dan is starting. He's the little homie, right? But up to that point, he's looking up to Lisa and particularly Ari Randy, who he, is his direct inspiration for writing graffiti and trying to be like them. And at this point, Dan has done something that kind of re-engages the culture and drives everybody to take a step further into the realms of graffiti, right? Um, Randy said not only him, but Gangster George and a number of other people ran pretty quickly to write their name next to you. That was the spot. Yeah. Uh, I can just imagine it being like a go-go signature Hall of Fame. Like, I'm just thinking about it right now. Uh, I would have loved to have just been able to walk over that bridge at that time to see that. Um, that, was a, that was a special place because it was H Street. There was a lot of activity there. The X2 bus drove over there. So everybody coming from the south side to the north side, everybody sees that. Um, and that was, uh, I think, you know, the bus line uh, for the go-go writers were really like how we treated the red line later on. Mm -hmm. uh, even though Dan and Southeast Sandman and a number of other FSC members would go on to, to paint on the red line, um, it was really not until the early 1990s, 1989 to 1990 to be exact, that real 
uh, real graffiti in terms of New York, you know, definitions started to be painted. We call them burners or pieces. Um, and while there were a few on the line before then, 1989 and 1990 are kind of a demarcation line where it just kind of exploded. And Sita, you you come in, you know, around that time. Um, do you remember the first time that you painted on the red line? Ooh, I can't remember the year, but it was the production with Russ and Da. Um, on, got, the, on the Tacoma wall. On the Tacoma wall. Yeah. Yeah. I've got to look at the back of the photo at home. I'm going to say that's probably 91. Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably 91. Yeah. Because MCA has already started. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, what do you remember about going into that space? If anything at all, I mean, you know, I remember the first time going to the Tacoma Wall, and one somebody told me that we were allowed to paint there, so it was legal, which I thought was just crazy. Yeah. Uh, but it's also right there by the train. The train's coming by you every five minutes. You're painting the entire time. Um, you know, do you have any recollections of, of of that time or even any other time painting in that space? Yeah, I mean, it's wild because since I was there, um, I got a job doing a, a, a mural project there in the same spot and I was trying to remember like wow I, but everything's so different mm. um, now the buildings are a little bit different um, but yeah I mean it was it was a really special time just because as you said it was it was I mean it was highly active with pieces but um, it was so relaxed like there were there was no one there watching yeah. the space nobody uh, we had to worry about so it was just super relaxed um, we would go there with uh, homies from New York and they'd be excited to paint in mm -hmm. DC mm -hmm. and it being so chill. Um, yeah, it, it was just, it was it was a, the perfect training ground because yeah. you were, I mean, right by the trains too. Right, right. You know, it's just, it's lively. You know, you're seeing trains go by with graffiti. It's, I mean, it, it's as, as real as it gets. Absolutely, you know? absolutely. I actually, I, I lived in Tacoma for a number of years um, but uh, something that sticks out to me about that space in particular, and, and yes, it was nice to be able to go there and, and at least think that it was okay for you to be able to paint there, although I know a number of people that got arrested at, the spa at that space. Um, but one of my fondest memories of that wall is that I met my OG Sec there in 1996, and Sec is in the back, and today is his birthday. He's 51 years old. Uh, I would like everybody to give him a round of applause if you could. Shout out to SEC, HOA crew. He's been representing Washington, D.C. in the graffiti culture since 1989. Um, that's a significant amount of time, for sure. Um, and I met him there that day, and he wasn't mean to me, and we became friends. Um, and some 30 some years later, you know, uh, and it's just a, a, very, uh, a very cool snapshot for me of a space. Uh, that's so special in D.C. and in D.C. graffiti history. And there are a number of them, but the Tacoma Wall is definitely one of them. Um, Lisa, were, were there any places where, uh, other than, you know, on the buses or on the go-go's, where the writers would come together, the go-go writers would come together? No, we never came together. We just beat on wherever you at. See him at the show? Yeah. Okay. And when, when you guys were in that, I, because I understand when I first started writing graffiti, I wasn't thinking about I'm going to be an artist, right? I'm not trying to paint something beautiful, right? I'm literally trying to write my name on things. And from what I got um, from talking with Randy and from, you know, the times that I talked with George, um, that that was really the attitude. Like, people weren't really thinking, oh, this is art. You know what I'm saying? we got to make it as beautiful as possible, right? It was a numbers game. Yeah. Just trying to write our name. We weren't thinking about the beautification of it. Hmm. Back then, who do you think had their name up the most? Me. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the best answer. That's the best answer. Uh, you know, Disco Dan didn't disagree. You know, like you were always at the very top of his list. You know what I'm saying? Um, so I, I have a, a very uh, 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 kind of unique relationship with Dan. I met him and then we lived together years later. And there are a handful of people that, that have a similar experience. But um, 
one of the things that stuck out to me about Dan was his uh, his catalog of knowledge when it came to the names of kids who had written graffiti in DC. It was like this database, literally, and you couldn't look at it on a computer. The only way you could see it is if Dan wrote it out for you. And so I have a collection in my archives is about 10 sheets of paper, um, which just has about maybe, I think it's about like 450 names. I haven't actually counted, but I think about 450 names on it. Um, every line, double line, sometimes in the columns, you know, with little notes next to it, sometimes stars and things like that. And that list starts with your name and it says up the most. <laughs> and I always thought that that was, you know, I was like, okay, well, that's what it is, you know. Um, and I, I just know how much love and respect we have for you. Uh, do you remember Dan when he was a, younger? No, I don't. I, the first time I really saw him was when he was on the documentation. I always wondered who he was. And he was a member, he was like a, a, a baby GAC, right? That, I don't know, GAC Junior or whatever, you know, I don't know how you would refer to him, but he was like, second generation, third generation GAC. So you never actually met him, like even at the Go-Go's or anything like that. Never. So, I mean, it's just a testament to, to Dan and like it, one, his, his memory, his love for graffiti. You know what I'm saying? That even the people that were members of his crew that he never met, he always lifted them up. And whenever we were having conversations, he'd be like, oh yeah, Lisa the World, Ari Randy, Gangster George. You know, he would just, and, and there is a list I have it in my house. There's a, a list on notebook paper, I, and so it's one of my prized possessions. Um, and I know he's done the list before, you know what I'm saying? But that was my list. He gave it to me, you know? Um, and it was pretty cool because when I actually started writing graffiti, I started writing a list of all the graffiti writers' names that I had seen. Your name was on it. Uh, Tears' name is on it. Uh, Tears here somewhere. Um, his name is on it. But obviously, Disco Dan is like yeah. the first name on the list, you know? Um, and I had that experience coming into Washington, D.C. myself as a young teen. Um, we used to do newspapers um, with my dad and my whole family. So we would come down to D.C. to pick up the newspapers and then go back to PG to deliver them. And along the way, I would see cool Disco Dan everywhere. And so, of course, you know, my list starts with Disco Dan, as many probably do. Um, after the red line started to, to get really active, uh, there was also a, a space, you know, that was kind of discovered. I don't know if this is the right word, but like Wake and, and Cycle, who were two OG riders, were riding their bikes down, um, down by the monuments, and they came across two train tracks that were in the process of having walls built around them and being covered over to create, you know, some space for a new hotel. And that space became an incubator for style in Washington, D.C., where all of the artists would go and paint. Um, and that place was called the Art Under Pressure Tunnel, or colloquially we call it the Hall of Fame, or LaFont Plaza. Uh, but in any which case, that space became a very, very central part of graffiti and street art culture here in Washington, D.C., with not only the writers who lived here, but any artists that came in from anywhere else, they were sure to go to this space in order to see what DC had to offer. Um, Tita, uh, do you have experiences down there in that space? I never painted there. Um, I would just visit, chill, yeah. hang out with folks. It was it was pretty grimy back in the day. Yeah, it still is. <laughs> Y'all did a lot of chilling down there? <laughs> yeah. I mean, when people are painting, and it's just like anything else. I mean, I know that whenever I was painting down there, I was constantly looking over my shoulder just because it's it's these two massive train tunnels and one of them is active and there's trains running down into the other one. You know, there's not always lights there. And, um, you know, in the 90s, there was, uh, there was you know, uh, homeless encampments there. There's a lot of things happening in that space that, you know, young 16-year-old Corey probably shouldn't have been around, you know, uh, but I... I I also look at it as a space that where like I proved myself because I went there and I painted and um, you know uh, I, I I was a part of the ecosystem that was happening there. Um, but you never had a, ch a chance to go and paint there. You just I never kicking did. it. Yeah, just kicking it, taking in the damp air. 
<laughs> this is pretty musty down yeah. there. Yeah. Um, Lisa, do you know about this space? No, no, I didn't know. A little bit after, a little bit after your time. Um, it's it's there still to this day. Um, I'm not going to tell you how to get there because it's a secret. But um, some some very very uh, important works of art, foundational to Washington D.C., um, have you know have been painted there, are still there, um, and it, it and it continues to be a, a space that's super important for for D.C. graffiti artists. Um, you know, we try to make a space like this that's open to the general public, and then. There are spaces that we still need to hold close to the vest because they are very important and um, they are very, uh, they are very, you know, intrinsical to, you know, the graffiti culture here in the in the city. Um, Lisa, you wrote graffiti for like four years. You think eighty two to eighty six? Yeah, about there. About that, and do you think that that entire time, though, I mean, you know maybe probably for like three, three and a half, it was like super important and then it started to lose its appeal for you? Yeah, I think so. Is there anything that you, you can think of directly that was, you know, kind of a catalyst for you to say, hey, you know what, I'm kind of done with this. I kind of did, I kind of did what I was supposed to do. Yeah, after my name, after a while, that year, and then called my name there. I wasn't in there at times, I mm -hmm. did my job. Right, they were just they were just shouting you out. You weren't even at the show. Yeah. I mean, I wonder how many of those tapes that I heard <laughs> were the ones that you weren't even there. Not too many, because yeah. I was already there. Because <laughs> you said write it on the wall so everybody sees it, and then we also know everybody wrote it on the, the sheet of paper and put it up. Were you doing that too? I did that at the same time. Yeah. First, at, in the beginning. Yeah. In the beginning, and then you were like, I got a better way to do this. Yeah. And then. Four years in, you're just like, you know what? My work here is done, I'm out. And I, I think that that's so, I mean, because I've been, I don't want to say addicted to writing graffiti because, but there was a, a few years where I feel like I lived, breathed, you know, everything I did was about graffiti. So it's maybe fair to say that I was addicted for a little while and still am partially addicted to graffiti. Um, did that ever, you know, manifest itself where you're like, you know what, I got to get back out there, I got to get my name up? Yeah, like right now. Right I now. I think about it all the time. Ah. But the type of job that I do, right. I can't do it. Right. Because I'm going to jail now. <laughs> Just as a, as, a, as a note in this story, uh, Lisa began her graffiti writing career writing her name on the buses, and now she is actually a Metro bus driver. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so wow. she, it would be a little bit, it will be a little bit counterproductive, you know, for you to be bombing the buses. But I mean, there's other things you could write on, right? And see, everybody knows me now. Mm. <laughs> so that's why I don't do it. Actually, I wanted to ask you because you know Dan used to have imposters, like bammers that would be walking around, being like, "Oh, yo, I'm Disco Dan," right? Did you have imposters too? No. No one ever claimed to be least of the world. That's what they're not. Wait, someone told me. <laughs> So they was just they they just laughed them out of the room. Uh, I had at least three people tell me that they were cool disco Dan, and I know Dan. You know what I'm saying? They're like, I'm disco Dan, and they write it down. And I'm like, oh my god, you know, this is wild. Ari Randy had a, I mean, well he had a, little Ari Randy. That's a little bit different, right? Like he was he was trying to you know show the delineation, but he felt the same way. He was like, why are you going to write my name? Um, that's that's. That's uh, pretty interesting. I would think that maybe there would be one or two girls that would be trying to, you know, fake the funk. No, well, what would have happened if, if you had found someone trying to trying to claim your fame? Um, I think that's what they want to do. That makes me feel important. Right. Yeah. Okay. It's the best form of uh, flattery, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, see, see, your uh, transition into uh, I guess more commercial aspects of, of art, like uh, uh, graphic design, illustration, those sort of things. When did that happen for you? Like, when did you when did you kind of like say, okay, I'm gonna pivot a little bit and I'm gonna go over here? I went to the corporate for one year and then I dropped out to start working as a freelance 
illustrator, painter. Um, Wait a minute, Michelle Love is an art school dropout. I mean, it's expensive. I you know, too, I, mean, I, was I, like, I am too. But I'm, how am I going to do this? I didn't think that. Yeah. Um, so I was doing that for a while, um, and then I got a job at Pearl Art in Rockville. Mm. And were you um, working with SMK then? No, he worked there. Yeah, I think he did at some point wow. in time. I thought everyone worked, everyone worked there. That was one the, line worked there. That was the writer spot. Um, his ex, his ex partner uh, Rob Smith. Okay. With the lock. Yeah. Anyway. Um, yeah. So I mean, pretty uh, twenty twenty one. Yeah. Yeah. And then, that's that's taking. I mean, you were already doing hand done flyers before then, I imagine. Yeah, so I used to work at this, my, my friend, um, her family owned community printing in mm -hmm. Tacoma Park. The, they're really, really dope uh, family owned business. They've been there for, I don't know, at least 40 years, 30 years. Anyway, um, we used to make all of our stickers there. So just get the flat um, letter size um, sticker sheet and it would just be, um, we would go off though. We would go really uh, hard with these designs, do like four up, six up. Um, and that was a goal for a lot of folks to come and print there. Right. So Russ was printing there. One nine was printing there. Mm -hmm. Da had a whole bunch of stickers. Um, so that kind of, I don't know, those two worlds folded in on each other. That was actually in, yeah, yeah, around 20, yeah. 19 or 20. And what year is that? Do you, do you have one? 91. 91. Yeah. And then, 92. so that was like your first kind of introduction to like digital graphic stuff? Yeah, kind of. Um, I always get the years wrong. I think in 96, that's when, no, 94, I started working for um, this Nigerian web design firm in <laughs> Hyattsville, Maryland, and I didn't know how to use a computer at uh -huh. all. Um, but I just, my friend was like, hey, I'll get you this job. You can design websites. And I was just like, oh my God. That's early for the web too. Yeah, so um, I just kind of, they took me under their wing and um, I learned a lot there. Um, started doing front end, back end. And yeah, I did digital stuff for like, I don't know, 10 years straight without doing any fine arts. Right. Took a, like, a hiatus without even knowing it and then came back in 2011. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 2010. Um, but it, you were doing flyers for like 3LG. And oh, stuff sorry. Like that. Yeah. God, yeah, Shout out like, to Head Rock. Who's yeah, Heady. Head Rock. Um, you know, we were we were friends with all the folks on right. U Street doing all kinds of, you know, all the genres, reggae, jazz, mm -hmm. hip hop, house, um, dance hall. And we were at those clubs. So um, folks needed flyers. Of course, this is before social media. So hand drawn flyers were a mm -hmm. specialty. Always something that I was really interested in doing. Um, you did some great work too. Thanks. Some of the 3LG, I, I, yeah. uh, Last Resort. Remember that, Hetty? Mm -hmm. I don't know if he's still here. Um, uh, but um, yeah, and then you did the installation at Chicken and Whiskey in the mm -hmm. back. Yeah. It's filled with flyers, and mm -hmm. I think at their new location too. So if you yeah. if you folks are interested in seeing some of those old pieces, those are good opportunities. And those were like great. I don't know. I don't want to say segues for you know for like graffiti writers you know to try to figure out something else to do with like the skills that you've kind of developed and yeah you're going out bombing and yeah, you're going out to do burners but what are you going to do you know what i'm saying to kind of make a living you know what i'm saying and i know for me you know i saw a couple other writers kind of you know going in that graphic design way pez pez one whose name is on the wall he passed away in 2012. he was one of the the earliest artists that I saw fully committed to like, this is Adobe Photoshop, this is Illustrator, this is how you use them. Um, and I just remember like him showing me and just my mind being blown be like, oh, you can create letters in the computer and you can just use the mouse. Like it was really like a, a you know, a, 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 you know, it changed my world really uh, because then I would then go forward to, to start to pursue those things. Um, and you were another one because when I saw the flyers that you were doing, I was like, oh, these are really cool. And then other people needed flyers and I was trying to do, you know, what you were doing. Um, and I did it a lot better on the computer than I did hand drawn, but whatever, you know mm. what I'm saying? Uh, those were, those were super important things to see for me, myself. And I know another, uh, other artists as well, 
uh, because there were we started to see avenues for ourselves. And I, I, I say that and want to bring it back to to Lisa because we talked earlier about yeah, you guys didn't really consider it to be art. But by like 1984, you guys were aware of what was coming out of New York City, right? With hip hop and, and the graffiti art that was a part of it. it, it am I correct in that? Yes, correct. And, you know, those artists were finding some sort of path either into the gallery or whatever have you, that where they're, they're, they're trying to ply their skills towards a, a, a commercial kind of aspect. Um, did you see any of that at all uh, amongst, you know, I know you said for yourself you didn't feel it, but like other folks that were in the culture were, okay, we're going to take this and we're going to move it a little bit forward. Did you see that at all? No, not the only time that I was able to come by the name of no. And do you think that that was because of that uh, kind of like DC, NYC rivalry and we're not going to do that damn in New York shit? Like, I can't say that, but. I can't say we want to be big and bold. Right, right. It wasn't about that at, at that point. No, no. Um, and I think a lot of a lot of the earlier name writers feel the exact same way. They're like, oh, why am I going to use five colors to do my name? I'm just going to go write my name over there, you know. Um, so I think that there is a, a even even in the traditional graffiti community, there's generational cutoff. You know, I have OGs that they don't care. They're not trying to do art shows. They're not trying to do murals. They're not trying to do none of that. I'm going to go bomb, I'm going to go do my burner, you know what I'm saying, I'm going to do it wherever I want, and that's what, that's what it's going to be. Um, but there's an evolution in the culture, I think, now, where, you know, we're seeing a, a shift almost in mass of, of participants in the culture looking for what's that next step for graffiti. Um, and I think, you know, I mean, obviously, it, everyone here in the audience has seen uh, the, the sheer, you know, numerous murals around the city um, and you know what many what many folks don't know is that a lot of those murals are painted by graffiti writers mm -hmm. um, and you know one of those graffiti writers sitting right here next to me is responsible for some of the biggest and the most beautiful in the city and so um, see can we can we talk a little bit about like all right I did the graffiti thing and I've, I've done digital art and now I find, you know, I'm saying that those two things are kind of merging together in this new thing that I'm creating on the streets. Yeah, it's interesting because I feel like I'm circling back to the roots, um, to those places. You know, we painted um, the alley right next to where the Stadium Union used to be, 1357 U Street, mm -hmm. uh, where Cloak and Dagger is now, um, back in 96. And then I got a, a, a project right there, um, right in the same alley, but across, you know, the, the alleyway um, in 19, 2019. Um, so it's interesting, like these fold, time just keeps folding back on itself, um, project by project, and, and going to different areas of the neighborhood where I have history. And I guess this is part of being older. You just, you start living life and you just start gaining experiences. But, mm -hmm. um, but for sure, and especially having taken that, that large chunk of time off uh, from creating artwork, from creating any, any type of work, painting, graffiti, and, and even getting completely out of graffiti and then coming back, it's all these loops. And I've just kind of like opened myself up to that and uh, trying not to judge, you know, just like, hey, this is happening, I'm coming back. And it feels like coming, coming back home, Yeah. you know? Um, I mean, I can feel the line work and everything I learned doing graffiti and, and understanding if you're painting on a train, it's going by really fast. It has to be readable. I want it to be readable. Mm -hmm. um, the scale of the work, who's looking at it from what vantage point. Um, all of these things are really important. Um, even how quickly you can paint, you know, right. back in the day, it was right. before you got arrested. Now it's before, you know, you're on the clock. The before the budget runs back. out. Yeah, the list has, the list is like $3,000. Right. It's gotta go back like tomorrow. You right. Know? It's, um, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just glad I'm still doing it. I mean, you've been doing an amazing job. I mean, I, I, Thanks. I I'm sure everyone here has seen uh, Michelle Love's work, but um, for sure, you know, as I think about uh, our mural community, 
uh, because I know many of the older artists who were painting murals in the 80s, not graffiti, but murals. And then I know many of the, uh, the newer artists that uh, Michelle Love is definitely, you know, one that I would raise up above everyone else and say, this is the best what DC has to offer, um, for, in my opinion, personally. Um, and I Thank just you. love the work that you're doing. Um, I have two quick questions for Lisa. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, do that. All right, the first one, did, you, did they let you into the club after you were washing it? Like, ah. did they feel sorry? Like, all right, you, you cleaned it up. You can go <laughs> and enjoy yourself. Yeah, that's what you wanted this morning. Uh, yeah. And your, your friend, too? Huh? Your friend, too? Yeah, my friend. Too. Okay. How was the show? Awesome. Did they shout you out? <laughs> and then, that was Essence, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, what's wait, the other question? I, I got another question. Um, in terms of tools, like, what were you looking for? I mean, it's, you know, Sharpies. And probably back then it was big, fat ones. That's Magnums. Like Magnums. 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 And where, where would you get them? Yeah, and would you uh, would you go to like Heckinger's or something to get the paint? I, I, nope. Um, where did I go to first year? I think I went on was it Pizza Class or what was it? Oh, wow. Okay. Was that before it had a roof and it was like open air? It had oh. Back in the day, it was open roof. Did you know that? You've been around but a it long was before, time. Before it had <laughs> it was after that. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you remember where you got that can of paint that you did, that you used for H Street? No. <laughs> okay. I remember the first time I, I used spray paint, I took it out of my dad's work room, and then I went down and I wrote all over the, the corner store at the end of the block, um, which, you know, yeah. Did you notice that, that you could take different chips off of different cans? And I didn't notice that until I came here. Okay. Mm. And I'm like, I mean, how, how would you know, right. you know, but. Yeah. I mean, I think everybody at that point, you just grab what you can, what, grab what you can and Maybe go. someone would have said something though, like, hey, do you know if you get that Windex cap and you take mm. it off and. But when you look at some of, the, when you look at the older go-go tags, you could tell that nobody was switching out caps. I think Dan right. is the first one and you could see him actually doing yeah. back cap flares and stuff yeah. like that. Uh, he's using the snowball caps. Yeah. Um, and that might be a byproduct of him meeting with you know, Da and SMK and, and the rest of uh, MCA crew and kind of getting hip or maybe he figured it out beforehand. Uh, Dan's thing was he used to, I, I, I know that he preferred to use stock tips. He preferred to use Rusto. Um, most times when a, a, a writer goes up and, and writes their name on the wall, they just write it, you know, one time. Dan would go over top of it three mm. or four times. To thicken it up. Yeah, and he would always use Rust-Oleum Ultra Flat Black. It would just be like embedded in the wall. And and so like when it was like 20, 30 years later, people are still seeing these tags. He, that's what he was doing. He was just mm. going over top of it. And there was one tag that was on in between um, Fort Totten and Brooklyn where it kind of looked like it was his tag, but it had been done. He'd gone around it a bunch of times and mm. kind of made like soft letters from mm. it. And that's like, he told me, he was like, oh yeah, I was just kept going around it and going around it. He didn't try to draw the letter. He did his tag and he went around it, around it, around it, which is very much like what the guys were doing in New York in like 72, 73. I always found that very interesting. Mm. I always found that very interesting. Um, Lisa, you stopped writing graffiti after four years, but you've been here the whole time and you're such a well-respected member of the go-go -Go community uh i see you out of shows um you do you do stuff with montu mitchell who's who's a great guy you know saying that's my guy talk to us because you know we've just gone through this whole uh four or five years where you know they were trying to you know turn the music down on the corner of florida and georgia uh we've got don't need dc we got dc love go go Oh, the mayor Mochella. said, yeah, the mayor said it's the official music, you know, um, and, and that's pretty sweet. But I think all of us might be, and probably you mostly can, can remember a time when they were trying to get go go out of the Shut city. Shut down. Yeah. And so, I mean, what, what is your what is your thought about, like, I guess the, the city's kind of corner turn in terms of like go go music? Like, it's not the dangerous thing anymore. It's not the, you know not the bad thing anymore. It's the music of the city. What's your take on that? Well, over the years, Go-Go is not the same since the start. Sure. 
culture, it changed. It just used to be everybody playing with everybody. Then they separated into the grown and sexy. Then the bounce beat came mm -hmm. along. Mm -hmm. And people used to blame go-go on a lot of fights, which that wasn't true. It's just everybody went to the go-go. And when you see the neighborhood crew and that neighborhood crew, it, 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 you're going to fight regardless. Go-go, right. right. the music does not cause fights. Mm -hmm. right. And that's the problem with it. People think that they do, and they don't. Right. So for me, I don't know what kept me going over 40 years, but it's just like in me, it's the beat, it's the music, it's live music, period. Mm -hmm. I just love live music. And uh, that's still your favorite band? Or you switch up the junkyard? R.E. is my favorite band, but right now it's Junkyard. I've seen you at the Junkyard, junkyard, junkyard show. Um, and, and one of the things that I think is so beautiful, just when you, I mean, I get to, I get to think about things that when I was growing up, like Junkyard was such a huge thing. Essence played at, at my homecoming, you know what I'm saying, in the football field. Those are like huge moments in my life. And then to be able to, like, I was on stage one night at Howard with Essence, like, just like, oh my God. And this was maybe like four years ago. And I was like, these guys have not lost a step. Like, this thing is cranking, you know. Uh, same thing with Junkyard. Um, same thing with Backyard. I mean, there are a number of bands that in the city that are making and, and doing, I think, incredible music and, and, and throwing incredible events. And, and you've been to a lot of them. So what's, what's the vibe nowadays in the go-go scene? It's, it's kind of different because a lot of teenagers shy away from go-go. They mm -hmm. like the scrap music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and people trying to get the younger kids back into go-go, but you're going to like who you like, regardless if go-go is the genre of, is the music of D.C. You cannot force nobody in a situation they don't want to be in. If they like something else, that's what they like. Right. You know, you can't force go-go on anyone. Yeah. You know? I think uh, there was a, a that, that D.C. NYC, like, battle that was happening in the 80s, carried on into the 90s a little bit, and then we started to break through a little bit with our hip hop groups but like uh, Section 8 Mob and, and groups like that. Um, you know, Priest the Nomad, Head Rock, who was here earlier, 3LG, like these, these groups started to kind of break through that, you know, um, that, that kind of uh, shield that was up, you know. Um, I think there's, there's, a, there's a, a lot of analogies that can be drawn, you know, you know similarities really between, you know, how Go-Go has evolved and changed and how graffiti has evolved and changed over the years. It's not the same thing, you know, starting from when when you started to when you started to when I started and even to nowadays, like graffiti has changed. Uh, people's access to the culture has changed. People's ability to inform themselves about the cultures have changed. Um, and, and I think that that plays its, you know, plays out, you know, um, on in the murals that we're seeing. Um, we, as we look around the city, and I think 2011 was the first commission for you, right? Like the first public commission for you. What do you, what do you see as being the the I guess the next step forward for the artist in this respect? I mean, their murals have come; they become popular. They're somewhat commercialized. You know what I'm saying? Is there a way for for that uh, quality of art to get back to maybe the the roots of the culture, which is a little bit more um, subversive, a little bit more I don't know illegal? You know, do you think we'll get to a place where people are doing illegal murals? I mean, I mean, this is legal. We got permission. With, but I mean, what you're doing here is taking that taking the culture and providing a space for it, which is very important. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, th when I come in here, it doesn't feel commercial. I don't see logos everywhere. Right. You know, I think that's important. And I think you're not, you're also not dictating what people do here. And that's right. important. Um, a piece of commercial art that's lost its soul is when someone's, you know, telling the artist to do something, not just, hey, I respect your work, come here and do what you do. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think it's up to the artists to just stand by their ethics and you know we're all hungry so sometimes you have to do that verizon mural you know what i mean you got to pay you know 
it is what it is. That's what hey. you do. You know? I said no to Heineken. But, yeah, yeah I mean, we've, we've said no to a lot of things. But yeah. there's a point in your career where you're hungry, you have to pay your bills. It goes, it's mm -hmm. the same for anyone doing anything. But you're going to get to a point where you have a, a portfolio that is uh, on the level that you get to dictate now. Yeah. So that you're just getting to that point. SMK said something in an interview in 2004. He was asked, what, what advice do you have for young graffiti writers out here today? And SMK's advice was, get paid. Hmm. Like, not do better burners, not, would say that. not have better hand styles. He's like, if you're painting and you're, and you're going to be risking you know, your freedom, potentially your life, to be acquiring these skills, then when it comes down to it, get paid. And that's been something that that's kind of like, you know, been in my head ever since then. And I and I think about it because I think about all of the artists that came before us, all of the the people that we look at. Um, I, you know, Dan would be one. You know, I think about Mask. You know, what I'm saying I think about artists that that I know are amazing artists that that have such cultural impact, and yet, in the terms of being a successful artist that has always eluded them. They, they, the opportunities have never been there. The places for them to, you know, to showcase those art, the, that art and to, um, and to turn it into commercial success weren't always there for them. There wasn't a path there for them. And I see such a path right now for all young artists as they see, you know, your work, maybe through my work, the work of other muralists around the city, and, and that they see that there's a path forward for them. Um, and part of that actually goes back to something I mentioned earlier, which is, um, you know, in my opinion, I, I think there are more women participating in the culture now, like 2022, than there ever have been sure. before. Um, I think there's a lot, it has a lot to do with the fact that there is a path forward, that the culture has come somewhat from out of the shadows. It's not a thing that's necessarily ha that you have to do under a bridge anymore. And I think that has like a big, you know, a, there's a big part of the, you know, the equation that, that deals with that. Um, do you, can you speak to that at all? I mean, I know you, you've met uh, a number of uh, other muralists as you've been doing the work that you've been doing over the last 10 years. Can you speak to that at all? Like whether there's a, you, you feel like there's a growing kind of groundswell of like feminine artists, you know, coming forward and bringing you know, and kind of changing the dynamic of the culture. Hmm. That's a tough one. It always gets pitched to women, you know? I mean, no, I mean, but uh, I mean, I think with Instagram, I mean, it, it's just kind of like equalizing the culture mm. for better, or for worse. Um, and everyone's getting access to it. You know, when right. we were coming up, there was no internet, you know, everything is available. So, you know, kids, super young ages are getting into so many different um, styles of art and, and creation um, with all these new tools that they have. So, I mean, the sky's the limit, really. Yeah. I, I hate to give you such a, like a lame I mean, um, and watered down answer, but it's just, there's been so much change so quickly in how much access people have. So, I mean, the lid's blown off, really. Yeah, I, and that's, that's kind of where I feel about it because you know, people say, oh, today's graffiti is not like yesterday's graffiti. I was like, yeah, well, that, that Nothing ship has like, sailed. <laughs> Nothing's like it used to be. Yeah, that ship has sailed, you know what I'm saying? Because any anybody anywhere can type in a few keywords and they can find inspiration and they can get connected to something that they were never able to get connected to before. And that makes, you know, this culture, you know, uh, just as viable as it was in 1973, just as viable as it was in 1983, as in 93. It's still, you know, it still continues to attract new participants. Um, and, and I've been asked the question, oh, do you think like, you know, doing something like this graffiti museum or doing something like murals, does that dilute like what the original intention of the culture is? And I mean, I don't think so because just for that same reason, there's so many people who have access and can actually engage and, and get involved in the culture real time now that it's just never going to stop. You're always going to have somebody picking up a can and going out and writing their name on it. 
Um, and I think that that's super important as we think about how we're going to um, how we're going to uh, address and you know participate in the future of the the culture because there's going to be a lot of young ones coming up right behind us that are going to have access to things that we didn't when we were their age. They're going to be better than us potentially, you know. Um, and how are we going to how are we going to handle that when that happens? I think it's super important in the culture and something that we haven't really kind of figured out yet because we still see there's you know generationalism and things like that that happen. But that's something that you keep talking about is 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 there a place where young people can go to learn the rules and the systems of graffiti from grandmasters? Like it's it's a system. Yeah. You know, and you know, providing a space where that growth can happen, a space where folks can can practice, mm -hmm. you know, without the, you know, th there's still the other spots, but like, is there another space where everyone can gather together? And that's something you're providing, um, which, which is great. Yeah, we're trying to we're trying to get some graffiti parks up and running. That's that would be the, yeah, the real thing. You know, we have skate parks, we have exactly. graffiti parks right next to them. I think in that way, we're really fostering uh, the next generation while also saying that, you know, we we agree, you know, saying that this is, you know, not from the city perspective, that they, they accept that this is something that's going to happen and they need to give space for it. Um, and that's not going to curtail everything, but at least it's going to give kids the opportunity to do it in a safe and kind of structured way. Well, there's an old mindset. And, you know, to be honest with Murals DC, the program, the thought used to be this program exists as graffiti abatement. And I'm like, why can't you just have murals for, for the sake of having murals? Why does it have to be to cover an area that's yeah. lighted with graffiti? Yeah. And that's something that they've kind of, I think, phased out of the language. But it's that old thinking, you know? Yeah. It's still there. I think that that, that was, you know, when Jim Graham came up with it, he was more like, oh, let's get these, get these kids who are running around U Street with spray cans. Let's give them a big wall and give them some focus, and they'll they'll create something cool. And it's created a lot of right. good artists through the, the program. But yeah. when you know the, that program lost its sight when they denied the artists the ability to do their own names on the wall and things of that nature, I think yeah. it kind of took away. From it. Thank you.